Hey, U.S. history students, going to talk to you a little bit today about Washington's foreign policy. You've already heard about the conflicts between Jefferson and Hamilton, about the National Bank, the Constitution, and several other things. But what about the stuff outside of the United States? That's what we're going to look at today. Now, here is America in 1790. You see Washington's cabinet, Jefferson, Hamilton, Randolph, and Knox, which we've already talked about in another video. Our revolution by this point was over. You saw how calm these guys are, just kind of sitting there relaxed. Meanwhile, in France, their revolution is just beginning. In 1789, we've got the storming of the Bastille. Uh, this is the same year that George Washington is elected as president. And this French Revolution keeps going and going, kind of spinning out of control. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Now, the French adopted a tricolor flag, red, white, and blue. America! Well, not really America, but they're, they're trying. And Jefferson believes that we should respect their gangster, so to speak. Uh, and Jefferson thinks, well, they want to be us. These French, they want to create a republic like us. And while maybe we shouldn't get involved militarily, we should at least support what it is that they're trying to do because they're trying to make a good faith effort to be like us. Now, Hamilton jumps in and he says, wait, they may want to be us, but they ain't us, all right? Uh, they ain't the United States of America. Don't even try. Just a bunch of posers, these people. And Hamilton, who generally prefers the British anyway, doesn't want us to support this French Revolution. Keep in mind the Federalists prefer aristocratic, stable governments, while Jefferson would like to see the March of Freedom go into Europe and the United States express an interest in helping anyone that is trying to advance that cause. Now, are things going to get a little crazy when you're trying to be free? Yes. But things got a little crazy in the United States and nobody complained. Well, I guess there were a lot of loyalists who lost their property and stuff, but you get my point. So Jefferson and Hamilton are going to clash because Jefferson says we should support this revolution, at least in spirit, whereas Hamilton says that we should oppose it. France ends up really ticking a lot of people off. Lots of European monarchs who are upset uh, because a king has been overthrown and they see the writing on the wall. This could happen here in Prussia or Austria or any of these other European principalities. So France is at war with all of Europe. What do we do? Washington asks his cabinet, how should the United States respond to this? And he gets advice, and of course Jefferson says that we should support the French, at least in spirit. Hamilton says, no, 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 no. And Washington responds by issuing a neutrality proclamation in 1793, where he says, whereas it appears that a state of war exists between Austria, Prussia, Sardinia, Great Britain, and the United Netherlands on the one part, and France on the other. By the way, that's uh, Dennis's home country. Uh, he's French. Of course, he gets kind of pissed off that I keep mispronouncing his name, but still, Viva la France, huh? Washington says that war is going on. Okay, how you think? And then he says that basically it's none of our business. The duty and interest the United States require that they should, with sincerity and good faith, adopt and pursue a conduct friendly and impartial toward the belligerent powers. Now, one thing to note here is the use of the United States and they. Uh, the United States was still referred to in the plural form, in the grammatically correct form at this time. The United States should in the plural, not the singular. And so Washington's neutrality proclamation is very important because there's a foreign conflict and Washington says, we are going to stay out of it. And this defines our foreign policy all the way through World War II, after which we got to be more expansionist. Now, even FDR, before World War II in 1940, he said, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars.
Now, although Washington tried to be neutral, public opinion was very much pro-France. Keep in mind that the United States had just fought a war for independence versus Britain and the idea of France, who had helped us win our revolution. We couldn't have won without French support. And a lot of people are sympathetic toward this. And Citizen Genet, the French ambassador to the United States, knows this. And he also knows that Washington's not very disposed to help him. So he decides to take it straight to the people. And he gets people all riled up and commissions privateers. These are ships that are privately owned, but they get papers from a government allowing this ship to operate. So these merchants in America particularly South Carolinians, which, uh, you know, we tend to be kind of boisterous when it comes to war. It's like, yeah, let's go to war, uh, that sort of thing. Now, keep in mind, the function of an ambassador is to be an ambassador not to the people of a country, but to the government of a country, okay? Even though sometimes ambassadors are pretty cool. I was at a restaurant one time and ended up sitting next to the Canadian ambassador, talking to him for a while, and that was pretty awesome. But... He wasn't trying to influence my view of policy toward Canada or anything like that. Now, the ambassador has to be very careful because he's dealing with the government. And taking it to the people is not a good thing. This is a no-no. And Washington is not happy about this when he finds out that Citizen Genet is stirring up public opinion against the administration, which is intent on staying neutral. And Hamilton says, hey, this guy's got to be dismissed. And it was so obvious, really, that even Jefferson, who never agreed with Hamilton on anything, says, Hamilton, you're right. I think he does need to be dismissed. This is not appropriate conduct for an ambassador. So Citizen Genet is then dismissed as ambassador, but allowed to stay in the United States uh, as a resident. And now Jefferson, although he believed that Citizen Genet had overstepped his bounds, Jefferson's chafing here because he's the Secretary of State. He's in charge of foreign policy. And he believes that Washington is taking a more Hamiltonian line. And Jefferson, feeling like he's losing battle after battle after battle, retires to his self-built and self-designed house at Monticello. One of the biggest indicators of the Washington administration's Hamiltonian foreign policy was the Jay Treaty. You might remember John Jay, one of the writers of The Federalist, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay. John Jay! Hip Hughes has a great video on that if you want to look at it. Guest star in yours truly. So John Jay goes over to Britain and he negotiates a treaty with them where the British say, we'll go ahead and vacate forts in American territory which we were already supposed to vacate according to the Treaty of Paris, which we already signed. And in return for doing something that we'd already said that we were going to do, then the United States will give us most favored nation MFN trading status. So the United States is saying, hey, Britain, we just fought a war with you, but we want you to be our number one trading partner. This is a treaty of amity, commerce, and navigation. Now, of course, Jefferson's going to oppose this Hamiltonian treaty and also people on Jefferson's side, the Jeffersonian Republicans are going to oppose it. So this is going to create a lot of opposition to the administration because it's going to strengthen the United States ties with Britain while creating more tension with France, uh, you know, our Republican little brother as Jefferson sees them. And people were so ticked off about this treaty that John Jay said that he could walk from one end of the country to the other by the light of his burning effigies.
as unpopular as it was with the people, Jay's treaty is also going to meet opposition from Jeffersonian Republicans in the U.S. Senate. Keep in mind that the U.S. Senate's constitutional role is to ratify all treaties by a two-thirds vote, to give advice and consent, as the Constitution calls it. So no treaty is finalized until it has received this ratification. The most prominent example of this uh, in history is Wilson's fight with the Senate over the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles, which I've done a video on if you want to take a look at that e-lecture and come back to me or look at it later, whenever, just as long as you look at it. But two-thirds of the senators have to go along with it, which puts these senators in a situation because you don't want to do something that's unpopular with the people. But then again, senators serve terms of six years, so they're somewhat insulated from public opinion, much more so than the House of Representatives. Uh, if the House would have had to ratify it, it probably would have failed. But in the Senate, although there was a great amount of opposition, um, there were two-thirds of the senators, in fact, exactly two-thirds. The Jay Treaty was ratified by a vote of 20 to 10. So if one more senator would have voted against, then this treaty would have failed. So keep in mind that the Jay Treaty was a pro-British treaty and is an example of the Washington administration's somewhat pro-British foreign policy in the midst of being a neutral nation. Now for a more popular treaty, Pinckney's Treaty. Charles Pinckney was a South Carolinian, South Carolina, woo woo. And this is in 1795, he goes to Spain and he settles the West Florida boundary. The United States had been disputing this West Florida boundary ever since the end of the American Revolution. In the Treaty of Paris, Spain got Florida back. And that's what we said, okay, they get Florida, but we couldn't agree on where Florida begins and ends. So Spain resolves this dispute entirely in our favor. Now that's a treaty. They also give us free navigation the Mississippi River. As you can see here, the Mississippi River flows into Spanish Louisiana. So the Spanish decide whether we can use the port of New Orleans, whether we can freely navigate the Mississippi or not. So not only do we have free navigation of the Mississippi, but we also have the right of deposit New Orleans, that Western farmers can put their crops here in New Orleans. Keep in mind that the Mississippi River is the lifeline of the early Republic, uh, kind of like the Nile River or the interstate highway of 19th century America because there was no infrastructure out west. So people in Kentucky, Ohio, Illinois, Tennessee, all of these people use the Mississippi River to get their crops to international markets, which is the reason that Jefferson is going to want to purchase Louisiana. So keep in mind that Pinckney's Treaty was with Spain and it was a popular non-controversial treaty as opposed to the Jay Treaty which was pro-British, Hamiltonian, and very, very unpopular with the American people. So that about sums up our talk on Washington's foreign policy. What you need to remember first of all is Washington's commitment to neutrality, that the United States is not going to get involved in foreign wars, in European conflicts, that the United States wants to trade with Europe, but other than that does not want to be involved in their disputes. So this is going to start a tradition of neutrality. But also keep in mind that the Washington administration was not very well disposed toward the French Revolution and tended to lean toward Britain whenever it could. So the British will be our number one trading partner. If this lecture's helped you prepare for whatever exam you're preparing for, think about subscribing to my channel. I post these videos every week or so and there's plenty more historical goodness where this came from. Until next time, my friends.